Let's see. All right. I believe we are live. Let me go ahead and get off this intermission screen right here. Let's see, my tea's still steeping, so I'm going to give it a few more minutes for people to log in, show up, whatever. Kitty's here too. Cat cam. Say hello, Richard. It's like, what? Why do you bring me on screen when there's no actual reading happening yet? I know, give it a few minutes. Sorry, I am in a mood today. Like, I am super excited about this. I've been wanting to do this for a long-ass time. Whew. All right. Let me just check a few more things before we start. Let's see, just making sure people have my... Which, you know, I probably could have just po postponed this a couple minutes, but whatever. Ooh, Richard's real annoyed. He just saw a bird outside and his tail is going crazy. Posting one or two last links, and then we'll start. All right. So this is something I've been wanting to do a while, as I said, because this book is like a garbage fire. Like it's basically a perfect example of like everything you shouldn't do, like either it, writing your story or taking constructive criticism on your story. It's like, it's, I don't really know how to describe it. It's like equal parts boring and like bewildering because basically the author like made this his Mary Sue fanfic, which people theorize was this character was supposed to be an avatar of Joan of Arc, someone who he has fanatically admired for years. However, he not only has no real grasp on like how to write a plot or character or on basically how anything in the real world works. He's also made the book more famous because he's basically, he acts like your stereotypical white American male boomer. And he's made the book famous because he has spent so many years since the book's release in I think 2014, 2015, since then to this day, he is still arguing with and insulting anybody who offers criticism on either his book or on his previous poor reception of criticism. So I, I'm not going to say too much because I think it's best experienced like as you go along and brain thoughts. Okay. So, all right, I'm, I've got my tea steeping. I'm just going to go ahead and dive straight into the introduction of the book. Uh, this lovely piece of work starts off with three quotes, which one of them is from the Bible and two of them are from later in the book itself. Cause like, but like without context, the two from the book don't really like make sense or really get us invested. And if you look at his previous, like, internet history, the author, Norman Bhutan, uh, he has on occasion likened the stuff he wrote in this book to be on the same level as the Bible. Which, coming from someone as purportedly Catholic, like, steadfast Catholic as he is, that should be a big no-no, maybe even a little bit sacrilegious, but I think we'll find out as we go on that he's kind of a hypocrite about stuff like that because I will stop on occasion to talk about the author too because oh boy there is a lot like seriously there's an entire damn wiki like made just about the author and his book excuse me all right let's get into it oh. first quote I'm very simple I follow my conscience I am what I do if you think that's easy try it for one day 
Teresa Elizabeth Sullivan Hartley, the world empress. Quote number two. What is man that you are mindful of him, and a son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him little less than a god. Psalm 8, 4, 5. I'm not really sure how you say those biblical annotations. Quote number three. You can teach millions something more important. When the world falls apart around us, we look within ourselves and find ourselves. Show us what's within you. British Prime Minister to Teresa Hartley. All right, let's g let me take care of my tea real quick. Finally finish steeping. All right, and don't worry, I do have another mug over here specifically for the tea bag. I'm not just putting it like dripping wet on the coffee table or anything. Let's begin. Empress Teresa, chapter one. I'm Teresa, the younger daughter of Edward and Elizabeth Sullivan, and I hope it's not bragging to say I was cute as heck at age 10. Everybody in the family said so. I was the princess in the Sullivan clan of Framingham, Massachusetts, because besides being cute, I was a whiz in school and had a good disposition. All the relatives expected great things from me. Nobody could have dreamed of what I would do a few years later, and nobody would have believed it if they'd been told. Prime Minister Blair said I'd still be remembered in a million years. Did you catch that? Like, it's literally written like that in the book. I'm not just inserting that to be cute and funny. Churchill, Hitler, and Lincoln will be footnotes in dusty history books a thousand years from now. Like, yeah, be it's kind of worrisome that you count Hitler in those list of historical figures that you could be compared to, Norma Baton. But we'll get into that later. And nobody remembers Charles Martel, who saved Christianity in Europe by winning the Battle of Tours 1,300 years ago to set up the world as we know it today. But Prime Minister Blair said I'd be remembered for a million years. Mr. Blair is not inclined to exaggerating. I was the last person you would expect to earn that accolade. I was a nobody from nowhere. When this story began, I was a little girl who didn't have much of a clue about anything. My job as a kid was to figure out what the heck was going on and what to do about it. It's not easy when you're young and everything is brand new. My father once served a tour in the Navy. He said I had to be the captain of my ship, but sometimes the seas would be rough. <coughs> Excuse me. I had to learn all I could about the world. I wondered, why should I be worrying about it in the fourth grade? I'd soon find out. We're lost in this confusing world unless we follow the directions of its maker. I did. It's the only thing that got me through. Everybody has pressures. There are two kinds. One is threats to your life and health. I had more than my share of that with a thousand assassins wanting to get me. The other kind is bearing responsibility for other people's lives and welfare. That's really tough if you care about them. I set new world records in that department. People were sure I'd crack under the pressure, but I didn't. It will take smarter heads than mine to figure out why not. I'll be telling my own story, which is a good thing because nobody knows it as well as me. Yeah, that's how storytelling works, Norman. Like, I'm not the first one to say this, but it's generally a well-known fact. It's common sense that that's generally how stories work. First-person narratives are told by the person who knows it best from their perspective. Good job there, Norman. Anyways... The drawback is that there are some things I can't know because I wasn't there. Something which we will see disproved, by the way, several times in the book. For example, Prime Minister Blair, no relation of real life Tony Blair, and President Stinson mention they talked to each other on the phone. They must have talked with many other heads of state, and it would be interesting to know what was said. It's a sure bet they discussed how to eliminate me if I got out of control. But I can't know any of that. Then how do you fucking know what they said? <sighs> mm. Good thing I brought tea with me. It can be frustrating not knowing these things. But remember, you'll learn things in the same sequence I did. Someone else telling my story could only say what I did in the world. 
they couldn't get in my head like you will. You'll see what a horrible worldwide mess I had to deal with. Like, uh, that passage, is it just me or does that passage just seem like really condescending? Like, it's like you're talking down to a bunch of like kids about what to look forward to in the story and how things are going to work. It's like, actually, no, that's insulting to kids. I think even kids would understand how a story works. Like, even from the first person perspective. <sighs> My story began quietly, with no hint of what was coming. I was home with my 17-year-old sister, Catherine, who was old enough to be my babysitter. She made it possible for Mom to go back to her part-time job without leaving me alone. Catherine hadn't been a whiz in school like me, and she was thinking of going to one of the many trade schools around Boston after high school. Mom and Dad said I should go to college. I mean, to be fair, trade schools like are underrated. Like You, you actually can make a pretty good amount of money like working for those, and they are vital skills. I say this now, it doesn't seem very condescending just from this passage alone, but believe me, when you see the sort of like class elitism that crops up later, then you'll start to look back at this and say, oh, that makes sense. Whew. Sorry, I'm gonna try and cut down on the tangents and just read unless I'm responding to chat or something. Oops, before going on, I have to mention an odd incident that happened six months before I was born. Mom was raking leaves in the backyard when she noticed a fox sitting on its haunches ten feet away. It was staring at her. A metal rake is a good weapon against a creature as small as a fox, and Mom held her ground. After five minutes, the fox walked away. This strange event seemed unimportant. My parents forgot about it for 18 years. Okay, now I can begin my story. Oh, thank goodness I've been on the edge of my seat with suspense about this. Our house was next to a pond, close to the river where all the neighborhood's kids spent many happy hours looking for turtles and frogs. I was lounging on the deck reading a book on the school summer list. Catherine was inside reading a magazine. Taking a momentary break from the book, I noticed a red fox walking along the pond's edge. Oh, excuse me. It disappeared behind the little patch of woods which Dad let grow wild like most of the neighbors. This was very rare. Red foxes were never seen in broad daylight during the summer months. It didn't happen. Then, something really amazing happened. It came out of the woods and walked toward me. I kept still and waited to see how close it came before noticing me. It was 60 feet away. 40. 20. Yeah. Another thing that you'll notice as we go on is that Norman tends to be really hyper-specific about specific increments in which things are measured. Like, he'll measure things in, like, like this in, like, specific number of feet or a specific number of minutes or seconds. It just... It's a little thing, but, like, it's just unnecessary, and as it goes on, it just keeps piling up and it gets to really wear away at you. By now, it was clear it was looking at me. I considered running into the house, but curiosity won out. The fox reached the four steps of the deck. It came up the steps, stopped, and sat on its haunches staring at me. It did not seem vicious, so I waited. In an instant, faster than you could blink an eye, a soft ball-sized white ball emerged from the fox and went straight into my stomach. I'm just going to take a minute. I'm going to let y'all ponder on that line that we just read. The only other thing I'm going to say about it is that Norman really fails sometimes to consider subtext in the specific wording of things. This is fine. I screamed and ran into the house. The fox ran away. I slid the glass deck door closed and locked it just in time to see the fox disappear into the woods. What did you scream for? asked Catherine, who had walked into the kitchen. There is a fox out there. He won't hurt you, she said, and went back to the living room. I stood at the glass door for five minutes, watching for anything else that might happen. At last, I thought it was all over. I went into the living room to sit down and think. What was that white thing? I couldn't come up with any theory. I mean, I can, but like, that's a side of the internet.
Florida that you generally don't want to get into at 10 years old, Teresa. It was nothing I had ever seen on those television nature programs. Perhaps it was a daydream from not eating enough. Mom had warned me about that. At age 10, I was already conscious of my weight and tried to stay skinny. That is not really something that you should be that concerned about at age 10. Teresa, are you okay? Is somebody like body shaming you or something? Hey, Tara! It's okay now, Tara says. Why? Because I am here. Thank you, Tara. Your presence makes me strong. I think I can endure this whole mess now with you by my side. Also, did you see the mug? It just feels pretty appropriate for the thing we're reviewing today. Not reviewing so much just reading and talking about. <sighs> I should eat something. Nah, it's the author's own projected sense of what women should be put onto the character. This mug is fine. <laughs> yeah, that is going to be a recurring theme through the book, by the way. Like, the kind of attention that Norman Bouton pays to Teresa as a protagonist is honestly really creepy. We'll get into that later. Like, especially when she becomes a teenager. I went into the kitchen. Wait, so... Tara, when did you, uh, when did you get here, Tara? Like, what, do, what did you get here? Oh, shit. Words. Like, what have you missed? Like, just now. Okay. So, would you like a recap of what just happened? Because that's actually not a lot, considering that we're, like, what, eight pages in? I literally just woke up after a 3 a.m. movie night with a boy. Honestly, worth it. That is a good way to, like, that is a good reason to stay up till 3 a.m. for Alrighty. I think I will. Okay. Where were we? I went into the kitchen to prepare an early lunch of fried eggs, a strip of bacon- Just one strip of bacon? Girl, at least get two, maybe three, if you're feeling extravagant. It's okay. You can eat more. I promise it's gonna be okay. A strip of bacon, toast, and milk. I gobbled all this down in a couple of minutes and soon felt better. It was too little eating after all. Nothing had really happened. Satisfied, I walked back into the living room to find something else to do. I turned on the television and watched the late morning talk shows for a while. I heard fire trucks in the distance blaring their deep toned sirens. These trucks could be heard from a mile away. They were coming closer and closer. Soon the sound made it obvious they were in the vicinity of our street. My intuition told me this had something to do with the white thing that jumped on me. Girl, didn't you just convince yourself that nothing had really happened? Like, what? Any I went out the front door and waited on the lawn. The sirens were very close, and yes, there they were, turning into the street. A tanker truck and a small ladder truck. The two vehicles went halfway down the street and stopped. Already, people were coming out of houses to watch the excitement. The yellow fire engines had loudspeakers that sent out vocal messages loud enough to rattle windows. A conversation was going on between the firemen and the station. Like, we don't really need the loudspeakers for that. Like, especially if the fire station is a ways away, as I'm presuming it is. Like, granted, I don't really know much about firefighting, but I'm pretty sure they would still have, like, radios or walkie-talkies to communicate from a distance? You don't really need the loud speaker, do you? <clears throat> a conversation was going on between the firemen and the station. Now you're right. Yeah, that's what, that's what I thought. Yeah, because like, I don't know, like, radios just seem way more practical than like blaring across a speaker and like hoping that somebody like potentially blocks away can hear you. What do you have? A hundred and fifteen degrees here, a fireman shouted. It's seventy here. Yep, we have something. A crowd of neighbors was gathering near the confused fireman. I walked over to join the onlookers. What's going on? I asked one of my girlfriends. They're looking for a fire. The girl's father said, The temperature jumped up in a few minutes. Somebody called the fire department. 
Like, again, you don't really call the fire department just because it's hot out. Because, like, otherwise, we've been having plenty of 90 degree days over here. We would have had the fire department here a ton of times if it was just a case of the weather being hot. It was hot. It was nice a little while ago. I thought it over. A fox appears in daylight, which never happens. It comes up practically to my feet. The white thing jumps into me. Again, subtext. And the firemen look for a fire that doesn't exist. All this happened within an hour. There had to be a connection. Excuse me. Before long, the fire chief arrived in his yellow sedan. He asked the lead fireman if anything had been found. Then they walked over somebody's property to look at the pond. Nothing there. Could it be a ground fire? The fireman asked the chief. Not likely with water over there unless there's a rock ledge underneath. We have to check it out. God, I know, like, I got really annoyed about that too the first time I read this. Like, the constant switching back and forth between past and present tense. And yeah, you're right, that isn't how fires work. Like, I'm pretty sure there would have to be, like, smoke or, like, some kind, some sign of a fire somewhere for somebody to call the fire station. <sighs> Thermistor probes were brought from the station, and firemen spent the rest of the morning pushing the probes a few inches into the ground to check the temperature. Like, again, I don't think underground fires are really a thing. Because, like, they would need oxygen, like, to actually become fires, you know? And you wouldn't really get that, like, so much underground. Exactly. Smoke is the most obvious one. But also, like, random pockets of 30 to 40 degrees more is, like, not a thing. Yeah, again, Norman doesn't really have a good grasp of thermodynamics. Well, let alone- well, really he doesn't have a good grasp on anything, but again, we'll get into that as we go on. Trust me, it gets worse. From They did this on everyone's lawn, the area inside the turnaround at the end of the street, and finally went into people's backyards. They found nothing. Around one o'clock, the temperature in our neighborhood had dropped back down to 80 degrees. The firemen gave up and left. And I'm assuming that somebody like got a fine at the least for calling the firemen for a non-emergent for a non-existent emergency. I don't know. I was young and inexperienced, but I wasn't a dumbbell. If people found out what happened today, they'd pester me about it forever. My cousin Mary was diagnosed with schizophrenic, and the whole Sullivan clan was biting their nails waiting for the gene to show up in some other family member. It wasn't going to be me. Like, girl, girl, you know that there's a history of mental illness in your family. Like, it doesn't occur to you that, like, maybe this is all some kind of hallucination? Like, at the very least, if something like this happened to me, I would definitely, like, at least, like, tell my parents or my husband or some family, like, what I was seeing, like, just to see if I was going, cr like, because I'd be worried that I was hallucinating. But, sorry, again, I'm going off on a rant again. I resolved to, ne to never tell anybody. Clearly a smart choice, Teresa. Good for you. Not even my parents would know. They'd think I was ill like Cousin Mary. I didn't need it. Mm. <sighs> Two days later, I woke up early and walked into the living room. Mom was looking intently out the window. What's going on? I asked. There are some men parked down next to the turnaround. They've been there all night. I looked, and sure enough, a van and a four-door sedan were parked in the turnaround where they could see every house on the street. Blocking traffic, I presume, because I don't think turnarounds are that wide. Mrs. Gagnon said a police car stopped to talk to them at 2 a.m., said Mom. They showed IDs, and a little later, the police left. Dad woke up and heard the same story. As mom and dad got ready for work, another police car came around the street, but left without stopping. Other people left for work. The morning wore on. The mail truck came by at ten. I walked out to get the mail while Catherine was in her room. Two minutes after that, I got back in the house. Wait, no. 
Okay, I misread that. Two minutes after I got back in the house, the car and van drove away. They had spotted me. How do you know that? Like, you have no indication that they were waiting there specifically for you. How did they know about me? I sat on the sofa thinking for a while. I felt I was being watched. Or was somebody listening? I spotted the phone. Was somebody listening on the phone? I dialed zero for the operator. Operator? How may I help you? Can I have the number for Alice Pizza and Framingham? One moment, please. Ten seconds later, another woman said, Alice Pizza, 555-8402. Thanks. I hung up. So they weren't listening. The weekend arrived. Mom and I went to Boston to shop in the Washington Street Shopping District. What? Yeah, I know. Like, we don't get any sort of explanation on, like, why she dials the operator to find out if she's being bugged or, like, any sort of logic in that. <sighs> like, I guess Bhutan just expects the readers to, like, understand his logic right away, at least if they're smart. We drove down to the Boston Commons underground parking garage. Huh, this one has like a triple or quadruple space between sentences for some reason. I don't know, I have the Kindle version right here, and I don't know, the formatting's really weird in some places. I thought I saw some car come in right behind us and park close to our car. We got up to the surface, and a man followed us. We went to the Barnes & Noble bookstore first because if we bought something, it would be small and easy to carry the rest of the day. I looked through the books on sale and thought I saw a different man watching me. Barnes and Noble had two floors. I'm going upstairs, Mom, I said. There was an escalator to the second floor. I went along the wall, stopping now and then, pretending to look at books, and that same man from downstairs always seemed to be close to me. He was spying on me. Or he's a fucking predator or a kidnapper. <sighs> this girl is way too fucking presumptuous and trusting of strangers. Well, maybe not trusting, but like, not wary for the right reasons that a ten-year-old girl should be. Like, this is a full-grown man, like, legitimately just following a kid, a little kid around a store and like, watching her. Like, that screams suspicious! girl. Later, we went to McDonald's, and I spotted another man who walked behind us into the restaurant. He was there as long as we were, and after we left, I looked back and he was coming out too, but he stopped at a corner. Another man standing on the corner started walking in our direction. We got back home, and my mom took things into the bedroom. I dialed the operator again. Operator, how may I help you? Can you give me the number for Alice Pizza in Framingham? One moment, please. I waited, and waited, and waited. A full minute passed by, and she hadn't come up with a number yet. I hung up the phone. Now they knew I knew. While I was young, I had some feeble ideas of what this all meant. My life wasn't going to be like that of other kids. I had to think like somebody important. Somebody with responsibilities. I was something special. Oh, honey, you are right about that, but not for the reasons you think. Maybe I was dangerous, or that was what the government was thinking. Someday they would come around and talk to me. I wasn't stupid enough to think they would just watch me for the rest of my life. Two days later, Mom took me to a nearby strip mall. There was a DVD movie rental store. I looked around for the classic movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. They'd shown it on television two months earlier. I played and replayed the parts of the movie where the astronauts talked to Hal. The most chilling scene was when astronaut Dave Bowman left the spaceship and a pod to retrieve the body of his dead astronaut partner drifting through space. When he flew back to the spaceship, he said one of Hollywood's most famous lines, Open the pod bay doors, Hal. But the spaceship's computer, Hal, went and opened the door. It was a creepy scene. The summer days rolled by. I saw the watchers following me everywhere. Mom did most of her grocery shopping on Saturday, and I usually went with her because Catherine wandered off with her friends. 
While Mom was talking to the meat counter clerk, I went down the breakfast aisle to choose something. Hi, Teresa. Some woman I didn't know was standing next to me. She looked to be in her early twenties and had a friendly smile. Hi, I said with a young kid's taciturnity. Do you have a cell phone? Yeah, call me when you're alone. She handed me a piece of paper with a phone number. Girl, call the police. You do not just walk up to a little kid in the grocery store and give them your phone number out of the blue. I mean, granted, we know there's more going on here, but you don't know that this is what's going on. You're ten. You're jumping to conclusions. This could be some creepy stalker or predator or trafficker or something. <sighs> Absolutely no logic in this book. Or if there is, it's extremely flawed logic. The woman knew that I knew about my watchers. Again, how do you know this? I had often stared at them. So this woman also knew I had to think she was one of them, and I had to be curious enough to talk her, or just incredibly reckless and, like, disregarding any safety. <sighs> when we got back home, I went to my room and called the number. My curiosity about the Watchers overcame my wish to keep Hal's secret. Like, you want to keep Hal's secret from... Space Odyssey? I'm pretty sure everybody already knows about Hal in that movie, kid. I wanted to know how they knew about me. The woman answered. Her spies must have told her I was home. Hi, said the cheerful woman. I'm Jan Struthers from the United States government. Are you alone? Yeah, are you? You know I'm not. There are 20 people with me in this room. Can we talk? My childhood was over. <laughs> All I wanted was an ordinary life like everybody else. It looked like I wouldn't get it. About what? About your little secret. We know it. I thought about that. Everybody had secrets. Talking to this woman wouldn't be admitting mine, except it literally would, by definition. Girl. Teresa, honey. More tea. I shouldn't have made tea. I should have gotten myself a margarita to deal with this shit. Something happened to you to make those fire trucks come to this neighborhood. You were giving off a lot of heat. We know you were, because we saw it all around you. What happened before the fire trucks came? I don't have to tell you anything, do I? Jan Struthers maintained her friendly attitude. No, you don't. But it will make things a lot easier if you tell us something. We're not going away. We will be spying on you from now on. We have to. Whatever happened is very important. You don't know anything that happened? We know a lot. Something from outer space came to Earth seven years ago. We've been looking for it ever since. That heat you were giving off has to have, has to have something to do with that thing from outer space. I considered that. Jan Struthers gave me a moment and then brought out a point. There is nothing natural to Earth that could have caused that heat. The thing from space did it. We watched you rent that movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. You are aware of that thing. What happened before the fire trucks came? There was no use denying something happened. They already knew. I saw a fox walking near the water. It came up close to me and a white thing jumped out of it. That's all. Honey. Subtext. I'm gonna keep coming back to this, but Jesus Christ. A white thing jumped out of a fox. Oh my god. Where did the white thing go? In me. <sighs> okay. Okay. All right. Moving on. How big was this white thing? Like a softball. Did it come from the fox? Yep. Came right out. What part of the fox? The stomach. How did it jump out at you? It moved in my stomach. I wasn't very enthusiastic about telling the story. Jan Struthers had to force it out of me one tiny piece at a time. How long did that take? Like that, I snapped my fingers at the phone. Did you feel anything? Nope. Did this white ball look solid like a steel ball? Nope. 
fuzzy like cotton. What happened then? I ran into the house and waited. Then I ate breakfast. I thought I was going crazy. How long after the white ball jumped at you did the fire trucks come? Half an hour. Did the white thing change you in any way? No. Does it make sounds or talk to you? No. Have you seen it again? No. It's like it went away. How have you been eating lately? Like I always do. Jan took a break to think what else she should ask. This was the most important interview since Moses came down the mountain. Adam's here. Hi. Fucking do it, bitch. It's got a pack. He's pointing his Nerf guns at me. Do it. Ah. Oh, shit. That one actually. <laughs> you know what? Fair enough. I brought that on myself. Here you go. Yay. I'll just get you back sometime when you're not expecting it. Uh, you always do. <laughs> yeah. Tara, this is a thing now. Like, Adam got me some Nerf guns of my own. Like, I have a strong arm right here. And now we kind of have a thing that we've established where we just randomly shoot Nerf darts at each other when the other's not expecting it. It is awesome. And I love my Nerfs. And I'm going to get a Nerf sniper rifle someday. 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 Anyways, back to Norman comparing this half-assed interview to the importance of Moses coming down the mountain. An occurrence which will not be the only of its kind. Tara says the best kind of relationship. Agreed. <laughs> we work. We pay our bills. We can fucking shoot nerf darts, nerf darts at each other if we want to. Oh, sick! That one splits in half! <laughs> <laughs> it's called the split strike. I mean, I haven't really been paying attention to the shit you buy, Adam. <laughs> Maybe you should. You're right, I should. Do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, he basically started shooting nerf darts at me because someday when we have kids and they start shooting nerf darts at me, he wants me to be prepared so I don't flinch when they do. And, God forbid, even take out my own nerf gun and shoot darts right back at them. Anyways, tangent over, although I did enjoy talking about that. It's probably, like, more entertaining than reading this book, to be honest. <laughs> Would you be willing to come in to talk to some smart people and figure out what this thing is? I didn't do anything. All right. She dropped that line immediately. You ran a 2001 A Space Odyssey. What did it show you? Uh, Tara says to answer you on Discord. Oh, uh, I mean, okay, so I literally saw it right before Bilker called me. I'm heading over there real quick before we have D&D. &D, okay. And then... Uh, did you order my boba tea, too? Not yet. Okay. You ran a 2001 A Space Odyssey. What did it show you? What the fuck does 2001 A Space Odyssey have to do with this white ball alien? Everything. Tara says, bah, never mind. Angry, frowny face. I'm sorry, Tara. It showed me don't talk to this thing. It's like talking to the devil. Do you have a name for it? Hell. Like the computer. The monolith was the alien, not the computer. The monolith didn't talk. Does Hale talk? No. It's a good idea not to try to talk to it. Don't stir it up. What is Hal? Like, Hal is the computer from the movie. Bitch, did you not pay attention? Like, no, in all seriousness, like, to clarify, like, she does actually start calling the white softball light ball thing Hal, and, like, we don't really get a clear explanation on why, only that it's loosely, only that it's loosely associated with Hal from 2001 A Space Odyssey, somehow. What is Hal? We don't know. We saw it seven years ago, but haven't seen or heard about it since. You're the only one who's seen it. Does it come from space? Probably, but that may not be bad. This thing may never do anything. I think that covers everything. I have to emphasize how important it is to tell nobody about this. Don't give a hint to anybody. If you talk to somebody, they will too, and you will never be able to live the life you want. No college, no job, no marriage, no friends. You'll have to stay at home all the time. This is the last thing we want. A lot of people are trying to keep this secret. What if one of my watchers talks? Most of our people don't know why they're watching you. Only the people at the top know. I'm one of the few people who knows you give off heat. 
I'm one of the few people who knows you give off heat. I mean, everyone gives off heat. We have a body temperature of like 98 point something degrees. Well, clearly that is not like common sense in this book. Apparently people are just now discovering that bodies give off a natural amount of heat. Hmm. Must be that new mumbo jumbo science. Without knowing that, nobody can prove you have anything to do with Hal. That's the biggest secret. Without knowing about the heat, they can't spot you or suspect anything. Oh, honey, you have no idea what's coming up. <laughs> Don't those 20 people know about me? Very good, Teresa. I'm impressed. These people are top-ranking officials from the Defense Intelligence Agency. Your watchers are people hired from outside. They know nothing. Can I tell my parents? That's up to you. But remember, if you can't keep it a secret, why should your parents? Your mother will want to share it with Aunt Jessica. Then Aunt Jessica will want to share it with Uncle John. Before you know it, 10,000 reporters will be parked in front of your house for the rest of your life. I'm pretty sure that I've read about this in, like, books describing domestic abuse tactics. Not if Hal never, never does anything. All the more so. It's anticipating something that hasn't happened yet that interests people. A break in the conversation. Let me absorb this new idea. This was heavy stuff for a ten-year-old to think about. Something else had made me wonder. Why is the operator one of you guys? You might ask the operator to connect you to somebody. Maybe somebody outside the country. We need to know who it is. It's for your protection. Bye, I love you. Bye, I love you too. Have fun at D&D. &D. I will. You have fun with your uh, Teresa stuff. I will. Will you let me know when my boba gets here? I will. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We need to know who it is. It's for your protection. How can I give off heat without burning up? Hold on. There was a moment of silence. I had stumped her. Teresa, we think Hal is doing a lot of things around you, but not inside you. It's like you're in a party. A lot of people are dancing around you, but they're not making you dance. That sounded reasonable. To who? Okay. Well, I'll leave you alone now. Thanks for talking with me. Call any time you have questions. She hung up. I'll bet the 20 people cheered her for doing a good job. God, it's so hard coming away from that southern twang now. There it was. They tapped the phone and watched me all the time. And they knew I knew I was being watched. But I said nothing to Mom and Dad. What must the spies be thinking about that? In a moment, I realized Jan Struthers hadn't asked me if I'd told anybody besides my parents the secret. They knew I hadn't. How do they know that? It's like they've been watching you or something. Teresa! Mother of God, Teresa! T! Sustain me! Alright. Sorry, like, knowing as much as I do about the book, like, I did not expect to get this frustrated again just reading it. Good God. One day, I woke up at 6.30 a.m., tumbled out of bed, and changed to jeans and sweatshirt before my groggy eyes cleared, and I noticed an orange spot in the middle of my field of view. Excuse me. It was right there in the exact middle, no matter where I looked. I hadn't noticed immediately because it was small. It was like an orange golf ball at 40 feet. I put on shoes and walked to the living room. The orange spot was always there. I went out to the backyard. Likewise, the little orange ball was always there even when I looked up at the sky. Hal must have had something to do with it. What is that for? I whispered. A few days later, I was working in the tiny garden I kept in the backyard. I liked to, I liked to grow pumpkins which were fairly easy to grow, and would grow eight plants a year in the small plot. The plants now had vines three feet long with little one-inch pumpkins. 
they would expand rapidly in the next month until they reached 8 or 10 inches in diameter in September. Riveting conversation, Teresa. I was pulling up the annoying weeds that kept sprouting up all the time. The worst was that prickly weed, whose name I didn't know, that would grow three feet tall if you let it. She like, I don't know the name of that weed either, but like, granted, those are really annoying. Like, I used to have to do a lot of weeding, like, when I was still living with my parents, and those weeds were the worst. Like, even wearing gloves, I would still get, like, prickles sticking in sometimes and poking my fingers. I used a hand spade to dig one of the prickly weeds up by the roots and fell to rock. I brought up a three inch wide flat rock and, f and threw it at a gallon water sprinkler can ten feet away. The rock hit the can dead center. I haven't even I hadn't even tried to do that. I found another rock and threw it at the can. It too hit the can. I got the rocks and walked fifteen feet away from the can. Can you guys bear with me? Because I can't. This, he really likes the word can for some reason, and I literally can't. Can, can, can you do the can, can? I can't. I threw the rocks while keeping the orange dot in my eye field on the can. The rocks hit the can again. I got the rocks once more and walked 50 feet away. Nobody could hit the can from this distance. I threw. The rocks hit the can. So that's what the orange dot was for. It was an aiming device. It got the rocks to whatever I was looking at. Interesting, but I couldn't see any use for it. Two days later, I saw 10-year-old Tommy Kearns walking back from the nearby convenience store. I sometimes saw him throwing a baseball with another boy. Going to Tommy's house, Mom? Okay, dear. A uh, fun fact, a uh, little known fact, like, this book has been edited or revised like at least a couple different times in that sentence about how Teresa sometimes saw him throwing a baseball with another boy in an earlier version that used to be replaced with a sentence that basically said Tommy and his family were homosexuals mom said homosexuals went to hell I didn't know what that meant so Norman at some point just edited out that blatant homophobia I don't really know why, considering he is pretty homophobic in real life, I would assume, based off of the evidence of everything else he said, but... Anyways. Going to Tommy's house, Mom? Okay, dear. Tommy's house was four homes down the street. I knocked on the Kern's door. The mother answered. Hi, is Tommy here? The mother found Tommy and told him Teresa was visiting. Tommy came to the door. Hi, Teresa. Hi. You want to pass the ball? Sure. I'll get it. God, fuck this guy. I don't. That is not even the worst of it, Tara. Like we haven't even reached the Israel plot, plot arc yet, or the lawsuit. He retrieved a baseball and two baseball gloves, and we went to the street. We stood roughly fifteen feet apart and passed the ball back and forth. I backed up to 20 feet and we continued passing. I was getting the ball straight to Tommy's chest. He was not doing as well. I had to take a step or two to the side to catch the ball. Tommy stood in place. Hey, you're good, Tommy explained, exclaimed. How do you do that? I'm a natural, I said. I backed up, or you have a fucking aimbot installed. I backed up to 30 feet. It went the same way. I hit Tommy dead on while Tommy's aim was typical for a 10 year old. Bad. Tommy's father came out and walked to Tommy. Can I take over, son? Tommy was glad to be relieved. The father smiled and asked, Ready? Yeah, I said. We tossed back and forth. Tommy's father had an accurate aim. I didn't have to step side to side to catch the ball. After a few throws, Tommy's father backed up to around 40 feet. No 10-year-old could throw accurately at this distance, he must have thought. We tossed the ball. I invariably got the, got the ball straight to Tommy's father. This went on for another 10 minutes. Other people had been coming out to watch. At last, the father noticed that I was getting tired. This was August, and it was very hot. Let's call it quits, Teresa, the father said. 
It's getting hot. Okay. I went aside to talk to Tommy. Several adults came up to Tommy's father. One of them asked him, How good is she? She's incredible. Someday she might pitch for the Red Sox. Or, I don't know, a good baseball team like the Yankees. <laughs> I'm sorry, like, I don't actually follow sports at all. I just had to throw that in as shade, specifically because it's the Red Sox are my dad's team, and I like to throw shade at him sometimes. It's a thing. August rolled on. It was a week before I was to begin the fifth grade, and I could think of little else. Most kids said they hated school. I loved it. It was there that I met all my friends who were scattered all over town in the summer. There that the girls invited each, other's to each, o each other to each other's homes. It was a working day for my parents, and Catherine had eaten something. I began throwing together lunch for myself. Mom had bought steaks. God damn it, I really want steak now. Thanks, Teresa. There was a new bottle of steak sauce. I tried to open it, but it was tight. The trouble with these steak bottles was that the cap was so narrow, there was no levers to twist it. I tried harder. No wonder little old lady starved to death. Well, either little old eight ladies, or people like me who just don't have any hand or wrist strength at all. No wonder little old lady, lady starved to death. A little more effort and the bottle broke. Steak sauce spilled on the counter. A steak sauce bottle had particularly thick glass and should be unbreakable. I don't know if that's true, but like, I don't think steak bottles are like tempered glass or anything. Like, I think they're just normal glass, aren't they? I kind of want to look this up, but I'll wait until after the stream. I cleaned up the mess and put away the rest of the food. I wanted to think. How had I broken the thick glass bottle, which not even a strong man could have done? Like, again, I'm pretty sure steak sauce bottles are breakable, but... Did I have a lot of strength? I looked around for something to lift. The living room sofa was the heaviest piece of furniture in the house. I lifted one end of it easily, but so did Dad. How could I tell how strong I was? I went to the basement and looked around. Like many people, we Sullivans kept lots of junk we never used. I rummaged around and found two complete sets of old lawn horseshoes, grabbed a horseshoe with both hands, and tried to twist it. At first it didn't change, but as I applied more force, Hal seemed to get the idea. The horseshoe bent easily. The next morning I approached Mom. I want to see Father Richard. Richard? She's talking about you, Cap. He's sleeping, or I would totally bring this Richard up on screen for a cat cam. She spun her head around in surprise. What about? I can't tell you. Honey, you can tell me anything. Maybe I can help. I can't tell you. Mom was worried. Something serious must be going on. But even at age 10, I had certain rights to privacy. All right, dear. I'll drive you. On the way through the living room, I picked up a burlap shopping bag used by environmentally conscious people who didn't want paper or plastic. What's in there? Mom asked. Horseshoes. Why are you taking those? It's a secret. Mom was really worried. She made a quick call to the rectory to make sure Father Richard Donnity would there. Donnity? Donnity? Father Richard Donnity would be there. We drove the one and a half miles to the rectory and were met at the door by the smiling 29-year-old priest. Holy shit, he's only a couple years older than me. My Actually, more like a year and a half. I don't know why I got distracted by that, out of all the things in this dumpster fire of a book. Priests were supposed to be beyond salvation if they revealed a secret, or something like that. That's what I thought then. Ah, Teresa wants to be a nun, he joked. She won't tell me what it's about. And yes, she can know the person's age immediately just by looking at them. <sighs> you know, Teresa's apparently just a prodigy like that. That or she has Shinigami eyes. Oh, he got more serious. Do we all talk together? No, I said. Me alone. Very well, Mrs. Sullivan. He indicated the living room, which served as a waiting room. This way, he smiled, showing me to his office. 
Father Donnelly sat at his desk, and I sat in a chair in front of him. Now, Teresa, what's on your mind? I have to show you something. I took three horseshoes out of the bag and stacked them together. The ends had small bends, and I had to arrange the horseshoes with one advanced over the one below, so that the rest of the structures would lie flat on top of each other. Then I grabbed all three shoes at once by the ends and started trying to twist them. I applied more and more pressure over some fifteen or so seconds, until I did succeed in bending the horseshoes about fifty degrees. I put them down on his desk. The priest thought it had to be a trick. He picked up a horseshoe and tried to bend it with all his strength. It didn't budge. He tried the other two with the same result. It was no trick. I had bent all three at once. He tried to remain calm as I waited patiently for his comment. The thought of diabolic possession had to be the first thought that came to him. Possession was often manifested by super strength. He managed to say, How did you do that? I have something from space. The government knows about it. They watch me all the time. They followed me. I saw them. When? When we came here. Mom doesn't know. They followed you here? Yeah, they're in the green car. I pointed in the direction of the parking lot. He got up to look out of the window at the small parking lot. There was a green car out there, a four-door sedan. Instead of driving into the parking space as everybody did, they had backed up so that the two men inside could watch the rectory. There was a blue car next to it, similarly backed in to watch the rectory. This car had a male driver and female passenger. Can you wait here a minute, Teresa? Yeah. He went outside. The window was open in the heat, so I walked over to listen to whatever I might hear. When Jan Struthers saw him, she instantly got out of the blue car and quickly walked over to him. These men don't know everything. Only I do. What did Teresa say? I'm not at liberty to say. It's not the usual still? It isn't. It's critical you tell no one. Teresa will be the first to suffer. People will come after her. They'll kidnap her, kill her, or worse. Who are you? I work for the American government. How many of you are there? Hundreds. That's a lot of people. Do you understand how important this is? I'm beginning to. Father Donnelly thought, th thought things over for a moment. I'll need to tell the Cardinal. Why? Teresa needs one person she can trust. I'll need the Cardinal's help to stay close to her wherever she is. Alright, but it goes no further. Don't call him on the phone. Talk to him in person. Jan Struthers walked back to her car, and he returned to his office. I'd like the Cardinal to come here and talk with you sometime. Is that alright? Sure, I said. A meeting was arranged with the Cardinal. It was concluded that there was no diabolical possession. I was a perfectly normal, good girl. My story, confirmed by the brief visit of Jan Struthers, had to be true no matter how amazing it was. I did so well in the fifth grade, it was decided I'd skip the sixth and go straight to six, and go straight into seventh. Sorry, I tripped over my own tongue there. I would graduate from high school at seventeen. Part of the decision to let me skip a year was my hair. It started growing very thick after Hal came around. I mean, you could grab a handful of my hair and feel the weight like it was wet. Mom was sure this, this was a sign of my change of life, and I needed to be with girls my own emotional age. Yeah, well, I was growing up fast, but it wasn't because of hormones. I was worrying about Hal, and so were a lot of others. Jan Struthers walked by me sometimes in a store or someplace when Mom and Dad were out of sight. She asked how things were going and asked, was there any news about Hal? I never told her about the orange spot in my eye or the strength Hal gave me. They'd hauled me off to some laboratory. One time I asked her how many people were watching me. Four hundred, she said. It takes that many care people to watch somebody 24 hours a day without being noticed. It would be easier if I lived in an Iowa farmhouse. They could keep an eye on me from a distance. But when Mom and I went into Boston, a hundred and fifty watchers had to spread out to keep an eye on me. It would be just as bad when I went to high school and moved around a lot. Like, I'm pretty sure it does not take that many people just to keep up surveillance on somebody. Jan said, 
I suggest that we just give you ten million dollars if you promise to stay home. They turned it down. They were right. I wouldn't stay home. <sighs> Would you believe that this whole hour of text was just chapter one? We're only like 5% of the way through this book on my Kindle. Good lord. I need a tea break. Alright, tea break over. Let's get back into it. Chapter 2 The high school years go by quickly when you're having a good time. And I did. The strength and throwing accuracy Hal gave me got me on the boys' baseball team where I was a star pitcher. I threw the ball up to 85 miles an hour, rarely seen in a high school kid and never in a girl. Actually, I could have thrown the ball well over 100 miles per hour, but I had to hold myself back or people would realize there was something special going on. Oh, oh I mean, they know you're special already. That's just the Mary Sue hormones at work. My speed was explained as being the advantage of being small like a lightweight boxer being much faster than a heavyweight, but not as strong a hitter. In middle school, I'd played unofficial baseball with a group of boys who recognized my talents. When the playing field wasn't being used, we went out there and practiced. I was still 12 when people started hanging around the field watching us. They were amazed at what I could do with the ball. That, out of context, that sounds entirely like something else. The high school baseball coaches came around one day, and the boys made sure I was on the mound all the time. They wanted me on the boys' team. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. You know where I'm coming from. They wanted me on the boys' team. The coaches seemed interested, but were they impressed enough to let me on the team? Like, I mean, isn't there a girls' team? Like, I'm pretty sure the girls' team would, like, appreciate, like, that huge advantage you bring to them. There had been a few girl quarterbacks around the country. This usually happened in a small school where they had a hard time recruiting enough boys to make up a football team. So, I'm... I don't know if it works quite like that. Like, A, I'm pretty sure some schools even back then had girls teams. And B, like, I admittedly don't know... If that actually happens in real life, like, if girls are ever allowed onto, like, boys' teams, like, if there's lack of a space, but... I don't know. I'm not a sports ball person. I don't know how this shit works. So being a pitcher on a boys' baseball team wouldn't be such a big deal, you'd think. And it wasn't. I made the boys' team in my freshman year. Yay, sports ball. Put the thing in the other thing. <laughs> I know. It drives Dad crazy. Like, because, like... He and my stepmom both are, like, huge, like, fans of, like, baseball and football. And, like, Dad has insisted to me all my life growing up that, no, I'm totally a fan of the Red Sox and the... Of the Red Sox and... What's the football team? The Patriots. Just like he and Krim are. Even though I've made a concerted effort in my adolescence to stay away from all things sports. Well, aside from archery, but that's another thing. I don't know. It's just... I just find it I just find it amusing now and then to like make fun of him about like sports things. Like I'll play up like talking about sports but using obviously wrong terms, but anyway, I'm sorry. I got I got distracted on another tangent. I'll get back to the book. Where were we? Okay. I was on television all the time. Now I learned something about the world. People said bad things about me on the internet. Okay, all right, I gotta go on another tangent. This section coming up, I am like pretty, I'm like 90% sure this was a section that he edited in like after the book came out on like Goodreads or Amazon. And this was strictly to address or like fire back at the people who offered criticism of his book. And, like, not just trolls, as you would think, but, like, people who had, like, actual constructive criticism about why the book didn't work, why it could be better, how the author shouldn't be, like, responding to said criticism in the way he was. So, yeah, fun fact for the moment. I wouldn't have thought it was possible. Complete strangers on the internet's social media said all kinds of terrible things about me. 
even worse with the websites that a few people started about me. They questioned my sexual orientation, or said I must have- the fuck? Hang on, my charger did something weird and like, my screen's freaking out right now. Where were we? Alright. They questioned my sexual orientation, or said I must have gone to bed with a coach to get on the team. They said I was making out with everybody on the team. Excuse me. There was nothing I could do about these people. I didn't know their names or addresses. They were internet trolls. Jealous cowards who attacked from the safety of anonymity and distance. I was told my only strategy was to ignore them. Being young, I felt the pain of rejection strongly. Kids couldn't deal with this. I complained to the school principal, and the teacher took it upon herself to counsel me. Mrs. Steinfeld, one of my teachers, approached one day and explained these trolls. These kids are being defiant. You are beautiful, intelligent, and you're often on television. You're a sports star. You have straight A's and high morals. All these things represent what people want in kids. You're the daughter every parent wants. You're the student every teacher wants. The young society... Or, no... The young person society wants. You fulfill all the authorities' expectations. So these kids attack you. Don't let them bother you. There's advice that you should take yourself, Norman. Or at least have more grace in like accepting criticism. There's one last question a person should ask before she dies. Do I feel good about who I was? Not entirely the appropriate question in Norman's case because I'm pretty sure he does feel all too good about who he like about the kind of person he is okay but what do I do now there isn't anything you can do just try to think of the future when you go to college nobody will ask how your high school was and you will care least of all there was a TV commercial years ago I never forgot a young woman had three horses and bought a fourth a miniature horse only two feet high she put the little horse in the corral with the three normal-sized horses. They sniffed the little horse and ran away from him. The little horse had very short legs and couldn't run. He walked toward the big horses who kept running away. He followed them everywhere but couldn't get within 50 feet of them. Finally, the little horse gave up and stared at the big horses and towards the house where the young woman watched out of her window. It was very sad. The little horse didn't understand why he was being rejected. Then the woman ordered something online. That was what the commercial was about. She ordered a dog door for the front door of her house. Now the little horse could come into the house and be with the woman any time he wanted. She talked to him and patted him on the head while she read a book or watched television. Intelligent animals like horses and dogs love close contact with humans. We must seem like gods to them. The little horse ended up better off than the other horses. The funny thing is, if you're not aware, that commercial is actually a real thing that exists in real life. However, it is an Amazon commercial, something which Norman both failed to convey accurately in this book and totally misunderstood the point of the commercial. <sighs> actually, you know what? I'm curious. I am gonna look up that commercial right now because we... I am just too curious to let this go. Okay, let's see. Don't know why I'm still getting FNAF recommendations. Fuck that shit. Here we go. Let's see. Oh god, fucking ads.
pretty cute, but like, again, I think Norman really misunderstood the whole point of the commercial and like, or like deliberately like changed the interpretation so it would fit into this whole anti-troll screed to make Mary Sue and Pris Teresa feel better. Let's see, where were we? All right. Keep plugging away, Teresa. You will be better off than these trolls. They can't follow where you will go. <laughs> Thanks, Samwise. I saw why the trolls were angry. They knew they couldn't go where I was going. That Yeah, that that's what the teacher just said. Thanks for repeating. Thanks for spoon-feeding us. I'd have a good life. They wouldn't. What they said made no sense. They were really mixed up big time. I blame the parents for not raising them right. Like, to be fair though, Teresa, you can have, like, somebody with great parents who, like, honestly do their best to, like, raise their kid to be a good person and, like, give him good morals, good opportunities, that sort of thing, and then the person just turns out to be a really awful person regardless of the parents' efforts, so don't put that entirely on the parents. My parents did a good job teaching me the important things. What I learned came to mean something when I was ten. I didn't know what Hal would mean to me at first, but gradually I came to understand that someday I would have great responsibilities. By the time I was fifteen, I was almost grown up. My mom, who came from another town, went to a Catholic high school. A teacher told her something the ancient Greeks said, An unexamined life is not worth living. Know thyself. Mom said too many people never question who they are and how they're doing. This is a fast track to disaster. They're not equipped to get through troubles and be dis successful. A perfect description of this book. The television news shows ex showed examples every day. My parents made a good example of the kind of people to be. I'd have to write a book about them to explain. It's enough to say I wanted to be a woman like mom and I wanted a husband like dad. That says it all, don't you think? So I thought a lot about who I was and what I wanted to become. This assured I would get there. I mean, uh, I mean, are you also taking action? Are you also being proactive and like making sure this stuff happens? Or are you just like thinking about it? Daddy issues. Ooh, ooh. Oh God. Oh Lord. Let's not get into daddy issues. Boy. Nothing else bad happened to me in high school besides the social media bozo's hatred. The kids I hung around with weren't like the phony kids in Hollywood movies. I mean, presumably so, because, you know, I'm assuming these kids are actual teenagers and not people in their mid-twenties pretending to be teenagers. They couldn't be, because nobody likes obnoxious elitists who form cliques and wear fancy clothes, drive expensive cars, and lord it over the less beautiful and talented. Have you seen the 1% culture in this country? I think that pretty much is the opposite of what you're trying to say here, Teresa. Eventually, people like that have nobody's respect. Again, proven to be not the case. Fuck the 1%. In the movies, the cheerleaders are cliquish snobs who make all the other girls feel, feel inferior. In my school, the cheerleaders were my friends. They were among the best athletes in school and admired a girl pitcher on the boys' team. They suggested I try out for their cheerleader team, but I decided I had my share of celebrity. Let some other girl cheer. Anyways, my schoolmates were good kids, and they probably were at your school, too. In the beginning of my senior year, Still only 16 after skipping the 6th grade, I began to think about college. I had one more thing to worry about that other kids didn't. What about Hal? Did the government know anything about him that might guide me in what to study? It was time to meet Jan Struthers for an update. She agreed to a meeting in a nearby Burger King, where the noise gave privacy as good as the Sahara Desert, to update each other's thoughts and info about Hal. Actually, no! That would be a pretty big breach of security protocol because you sure as hell just don't talk about classified things in the middle of a fucking Burger King within earshot of other people. Like, I, like, granted, I only know about the stuff from my mom. She works with classified information with the government, military contracting, missiles, some sort of shit, and even I have gathered as much just from listening to her talk about work that this is not how you handle confidentiality. 
When I was 10 years old, I hadn't worried much about how the government had found Hal before he merged with me. Now I was curious and asked Jan about it. When you were three years old, an amateur astronomer in Arizona was looking for comets. He had a telescope in his backyard. He noticed a curved streak of light in the sky. A comet will move in a straight line, not a curve. I'm pretty sure that is not true. He sent a message to all his comet hunting friends, and the government heard about it. The military set up planes to watch this thing coming down to Earth. It was a hundred foot wide white ball. It hit it down to Framingham, and helicopters watched it reach the ground. They thought it might bounce or explode when it hit the ground. It didn't. It just went into the ground without rustling the leaves on the trees it passed through. The helicopter crews couldn't believe their eyes. President Sheffield authorized a secret office in the Pentagon, the Office of Orbital Phenomena Surveillance. Oops, for short. <laughs> Oops. It was supposed to keep tr that they don't even play that off as a joke like you would think they like they are completely unironically serious about the acronym being oops. It was supposed to keep track of all the space junk we put into orbit. Its real purpose was to watch for anything going on anywhere on the world that would later or that would be something Hal was doing. How would you even know what to be watching for? Seven years later, Hal merged with you and gave off enough heat for a few hours to bring in the fire trucks. This was the kind of thing Oops was looking for. Okay, hang on. Math time. Seven years later, when Teresa was ten, it merged with her. It, 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 this thing supposedly came down to Earth when she was three years old. However, the previous host for Hal, the Fox, showed up to watch Teresa's mother when she was still pregnant with Teresa. Get ready for more failure to keep track of timelines like that. This was the kind of thing Oops was looking for. They came to your street and aimed sensitive infrared cameras at everything. They saw the heat coming from you. President Gardner had an intelligence agency set up your watchers. How did you get involved? When you ran to that 20 2001 movie, they knew you were aware of how. How? They never explained that. No, I don't think Bhutan even explains that a anywhere. The president wanted somebody to go talk to you and find out what you knew, but you were only ten years old. I was chosen because they thought you would trust a young woman. Jan and I updated each other on our thoughts. I hadn't heard a peep out of Hal in the six years since he merged with me. It was a safe bet he didn't travel a million light years just to watch me take showers, gross, and neither could be interested only in me. His interest must be the world. But for some mysterious reason, he'd chosen me as his base of opera excuse me, as his base of operations. Perhaps he had no real interest in me at all, but only used my senses to see and hear the world I lived in. Perhaps he'd leave me sometime and merge with somebody else. As for why so much time was spent watching me, Jan revealed that no other Hal had been detected anywhere in the world. I was an exclusive club of one. How did you know there's no other Hal? Did you ask around? No. If we did that, somebody would talk. And even if we didn't give your name, your watchers would know that's why they watch you. They would give you away. Years ago, we noticed a column of disturbed air above you that goes right up to space. We see it with Doppler radar. It's too faint to be seen by those weather station Doppler radars because they scan horizontally. But we can see it with a radar beam aimed down. We sent up a spy satellite looking for these columns and yours was the only one we found. How much does a satellite cost? Actually, I think I could probably ask Dad like about the physics of this because he's a satellite contractor now. Because like, I don't know if he works directly with like engineering the satellites, but like he does work with them in some capacity. I don't know. That's something I want to do now. Like, I want to message him asking about this and like ask his thought on like the physics involved, like just with this book in general, because holy shit, that could that could be potentially gold. How much does a satellite cost? Over a hundred million. Mostly it's the rocket. Tell you what, give me the money and I'll give you how. Yes, maybe I'll, I don't know, like maybe I'll just like ask him about it and then like post the answers like on Twitter or something later or like make a video about it. I don't know. 
Maybe I can ask my mom about how some of the government and military stuff works, too. Or, or my stepdad, even, because, like, he's a veteran. He would know. The talk moved on. What Hal was made of and how he worked was still a mystery. More important was his purpose. What could that be? It could be anything. Jan was reminded of those lines in the movie Contact. A female astronomer is about to go on a trip to meet an alien race. Technicians give her a cyanide pill, saying they could think of a thousand things that could go wrong. But what worried them the most was what they couldn't think of. It's the same here. There's no guessing why Hal is here. Jan told me I must get as broad an education as possible to be ready to deal with any unimaginable challenge Hal gave me. It was possible I would have to be the ambassador between the world and the aliens. The odds were they'd be benevolent, but if not, I had to be prepared to deal with great difficulties. What these might be was completely unpredictable. I had to be ready for anything. Other people thought about their home, their neighborhood, their town. I had to think globally. Yeah, because no teenager nowadays is concerned with worldwide events. This was a new concept for me. In every book, movie, and TV show I'd ever seen, the issue was about something local. Never did the whole world become part of the story. It was nearly overwhelming. How much do you expect from me? I asked. Don't lose sleep over it. You have the United States government ready to help you. But if Hal starts talking and asking questions, he may demand instant answers. You may have to act quickly. You might need the knowledge of Thomas Jefferson and the wisdom of Abraham Lincoln. Oh, is that all? Nothing might happen for 40 years. Don't worry about it now. If I have that much time, I'll major in alien relations. I got home from school before my parents got back from work and brought in the mail. In late March of my senior year, I got a letter with no postage stamp and no address except my name, Teresa Sullivan. It read like this. Hello, neighbor. Can we talk to you about selling Arbon? No, that's not it. It read like this. Where is Jan Struthers? Meet me in the Framingham Library, Saturday, 1 o'clock p.m. Jeremy Benton. Who the heck was Jeremy Benton? And what was he saying about Jan? Jan had given me an email address I used to contact her to set up meetings such as the update meeting last fall. It was Jan's Watchers at Snoop.gov. Snoop like Snoop Dog? I could find no such government website. Obviously, it was something created just for her. I sent an email. A few minutes later, I got a response. Failure notice. No MX or A records for Snoop.gov. For the first time since Hal merged with me, I was afraid. What happened to Jan? Who was Jeremy Benton and what did he want with me? Who can I talk to? Not to mom and dad. I was too afraid to go meet this guy. I had decided not to meet with him when I had a good idea. Father Donnelly knew, knew everything. If I brought him along, what could happen at a public library? Father Donnelly and I entered the library and looked around. A neatly dressed man in his forties waved to us from a corner table. This had to be Jeremy. We walked over and he introduced himself. Hello, I'm Jeremy Benton, personal aide to Prime Minister of England, Peter Blair. Please sit down. We sat, but instead of talking, Jeremy stared at me. What's the matter? I asked. Seeing you close like this took my breath away. Do you realize the effect you have on people? He meant the effect I had on people who were aware that I was the world's telephone, communi telephone connection to the aliens. Oh lord, yep. I'm beginning to. Can we talk about Hal? Sure, I said. Father Donnelly knows about him. Your friend John Struthers mailed a package of four volumes to Canadian Prime Minister Jean Turgeon. Or Jean Turgeon. He sent it to Prime Minister Blair. It's clearly a call for help. What happened to Jan? We don't know. All traces of her end when President Martin was sworn in. How do you know that? We have people looking for her. She had credit cards and bank accounts. They were closed. She seems to have disappeared from the earth. Somebody thought she knew too much. John Struthers documented everything. The volumes contain thousands of pictures of you from age 10. Fucking creepy, but okay. Your activities day by day, your school records and papers, information about your parents and the people who live on your street. I assure you, no biography I've read has so much information about a human being. Somebody clearly hasn't heard about Chris Chan. Jan Struthers asked that if anything happened to you, the Canadian Prime Minister make a big fuss about it to the press. 
Apparently something happened to Jan Struthers herself, but the packet she sent was actually mailed by her father, Toral Struthers. We think they had some kind of prearrangement. We have spied on her father. He appears happy enough. His daughter must be safe somewhere. I thought about all this while my companions waited. If they thought I had ideas about what the heck was going on, they were wrong. What do you think happened? I asked. Your president, William Martin, was sworn in two months ago. May we assume he didn't know about you and Hal before then? Yeah. Jan said somebody elected president is briefed on all burning issues before taking office so he could take off running. But I don't think Hal was an emergency. He didn't find out until he was sworn in. Then we can presume he didn't like the table setting and changed it. Yeah. Didn't Prime Minister Blair ask him? Good lord, no. This might make things very difficult for your friend. Oh, yeah. Great. We had a perfectly harmless thing going on, and President Martin didn't like it. What was he thinking? What do you think President Martin is doing? That is impossible to guess. Prime Minister Blair assured me he would do nothing. But we don't know what kind of guy the president is. Quite right. You've had a President Gardner who knew about you. He changed nothing about your arrangement with Miss Struthers? No. Do you think President Martin may cause trouble for me? Jan Struthers believes so. We assumed she talked with him, but didn't like what he said. What do you suggest I do? You could talk to President Martin yourself, or come to England with your parents. We'll give you no identities. Father Donnerty spoke. The Holy Father is interested in your case. He'll protect you in Rome. I had options. None of them were very good. Why? I mean... Theoretically speaking, why couldn't you just go and talk to the president and, like, set his mind at ease or, like, clarify some stuff for him? At least show him what kind of person you are? No, I'll wait a while and see what happens. Smart choice, Teresa. Okay. Miss Struther suggested we bring your situation to the public and get you the public support. Perhaps you can do that yourself. Is there any way you can prove Hal's presence? Father Donnerty wrapped a leg around my ankles to warn me. Jeremy might be from the president and trying to get new information about Hal. I didn't have to tell him anything new. I give off heat. That's how the government found me. If you have the right equipment, you can see the heat around me. Ah! We can do that and show the press! Then what kind of life do I have? They'll never leave me alone. I see your point. It's a difficult problem. The discussion was over. Father Donnerty said he'd keep an eye on me and call the Canadian Prime Minister if anything went wrong. There was nothing else to do for now. Who said youth is the happiest time? That's when we're most vulnerable. I couldn't even share this with my parents. One mistake on their part and my future was ruined before I had it. All this started with damn Hal. What was Hal? Would I ever know? And as for President Martin, I'd learned that somebody with eloquence may not have seen his powers of understanding receive any aid from education. Ignorance and deficiency of mental improvement could still remain. There's some quirk in their personality that keeps them from becoming wise. The president gave great orations, but he was, in the, but he was a babe in the woods when it came to dealing with me. Instead of shutting Jan up, why didn't he send her to talk to me? If she told me the president was worried, I'd agree with, to meet with him somewhere. What was there in my history that made him think I couldn't be trusted? It was like some of my fellow seniors. Twelve years of education hadn't taught them a thing about human nature. They labeled people. They were suspicious. They bullied or, or were obnoxious in some way. They were not worth much to themselves or anybody else. From age ten when Hal merged with me, I had tried to make myself the best person I could. If Hal wanted me to do something good, I was ready. If something bad, I wouldn't do it. President Martin should have left things alone. <sighs> okay. Here's the thing. We're at chapter three now, but um, I would like to take a break and get some food in my stomach because I forgot to eat breakfast this morning. So I don't know. All right, let's go ahead and take like a half hour break and then we'll come back and and then I'll come back and like read two more chapters, like just just to get to where shit starts to get real. So, all right. I'll go ahead and pause the stream here. Oh, Jesus, that's commitment. I know, like, I was excited to read about this. Okay, so I'll go ahead and stop the stream here. I'll get some food. We'll resume another... We'll resume again around, like, 1 o'clock. All right, bye, Tara. You go ahead and get some food, too. And, um, and good luck again on the move. 
Okay, so I will be right back. <laughs>